This lesson is going to be the map for the rest of the bacterial series. We're laying out the course in which order we're going to do which bacteria. But this also is an opportunity to change the way you've been thinking about studying microbiology. What you're going to see happen is there's going to be a combination of microbiologic diagnosis taken from the algorithm for laboratory diagnosis from the last lesson, and then a more practical organization of bacteria. You're going to see me slip between abbreviations, full names, only the genus, only the species, and sometimes the diagnosis. It isn't because I'm lazy or don't know what it is. It's because I'm trying to show you that that big microbiology textbook that has every bacteria in it isn't what you need to study. The amount that you need to know for clinical microbiology is actually very small. So this is our organization, the OME taxonomy, and also the map for the rest of the course. I don't expect you to be able to draw this out, as many workbooks would have you do. I want you to see and reflect why we've chosen to do it the way we've done it, because it'll help you take the test, but also practice medicine. Start off with gram positives. The first thing, of course, we're going to do is look at the shape. Those that are in the shape of a circle are gram positive cocci. Gram positive cocci is the subject of lesson six. When you have gram positive cocci, the next step to take is to assess the colonies and for the presence of catalase. Those organisms that form colonies in the shape of clusters will also be catalase positive. Catalase positive cocci forming in clusters are staph species. All staphs cluster and catalase positive. Once you have staphs, you want to know if it's staph aureus or not. To do that, you use a coagulase. The only time you call on coagulase is for staphs, because the only organism that is coagulase positive is staph aureus. When you're down to staph aureus, you can have either methicillin-resistant staph aureus or methicillin-sensitive staph aureus. The one on the bottom is sensitive. The antibiotic you choose to separate them is methicillin. All those staphs that are clusters and catalase positive that do not have coagulase are probably mistakes. They are contaminant staph. This will happen to you in the hospital. A human being has to draw the blood culture. They have to touch the person's arm, put a needle into the vein, and draw the blood. Some cultures are harder to get, but people have worse veins. Human error can cause contaminants to be obtained. When you first see gram-positive cocci in clusters, you freak out and think it's MRSA in the blood. And then the next day, coag-negative staph. Coag-negative staph is a thing. It means, ah, don't worry about it. It's contaminant. Now you can get disease with coag negative staph, especially when four to four blood culture bottles are positive and you have a plastic catheter in someone's bloodstream, like a central line, for example. But in reality, coag negative staph means, oh good, don't worry about it, it's not staph aureus. But on a test, they may still expect you to be able to separate out the useless contaminant staphs, that is saprophyticus, from epidermidis. The one on the bottom is sensitive. The antibiotic you choose is novobicin. We come back up to colonies and catalase. These, the staphs are all clusters and catalase positive. Well, you can also have 
chains and catalase negative. Did you see that? You can only have one of two options, chains catalase negative and clusters catalase positive. All staphs, clusters, and catalase positives. All streps, chains, and catalase negative. If you have streps, the next thing you want to look at is the hemolytic pattern. If there is complete hemolysis, you have beta hemolytic streps, of which there are two options. Group B strep agalactiae and group A strep pyogenes. The one on the bottom is sensitive. The antibiotic you use because it's beta hemolytic is bacitracin. Group A strep pyogenes causes pharyngitis and skin infections. Group B strep agalactiae causes neonatal septicemia because it's in the normal flora of the vagina. You're not going to confuse the two, but on a test, they might ask you to separate them based on the microbiologic diagnosis alone. If there is incomplete, but there is some hemolysis, that means we have alpha hemolytic streps. Two options. There is the viridans group and strep pneumoniae, which we'll refer to as strep pneumo. Strep pneumo is the one on the bottom. It's sensitive because it's got a little O with a tail on it. We know we use optochin. And if there is no hemolysis, we've got gamma hemolytic streps, which for you is going to mean only enterococcus. You don't use antibiotics to confirm you use growth in high salt or bile. That's all of the streps and staphs which you're going to need to know. Laid out geographically on the board with the sensitive one on the bottom. If we go back up to the top, those gram-positive organisms that have the shape of rods are the gram-positive rods. We're going to deviate. The staphs and streps probably felt familiar. That was all microbiologically done, and it was laid out a little bit better than most textbooks do. But now we're going to take a major divergence. All right, we're going to do the things that make sense. The first thing you want to ask when you have gram-positive rods is, are they spore formers? If yes, they are the gram-positive rod spore formers. Only gram-positive rods form spores. The question for the spore formers is, are they aerobic or anaerobic? The aerobic species is bacillus. Bacillus anthracis causes anthrax. B. serious causes diarrhea. And once we get to that point, we do use a little bit of microbiology. B. serious, it's a capsule and it's a modal. Those that don't use oxygen, the anaerobes, are clostridium species. Perfringes, 
tetany, causes tetanus. Botulinum causes botulism. And C. diff causes C. diff colitis. Perpharyngeal.